I'd have to find them. How are your carpentry skills? <laughs> They're not so great. <laughs> That's what's making news in America this morning. Thursday, October 13th, and the committee on January 6th says it's time for an update. We start here. In what's expected to be the final hearing before the midterm elections, the House Select Committee convenes at the Capitol. It's the series finale. Uh, this is their final hearing. What we're expecting and who's not expected to show up. Liar, liar, set your money on fire. Ordered to pay almost a billion dollars to the Sandy Hook families that he defamed. A Sandy Hook defamation case will cost Alex Jones everything he's got. And after being prescribed in record numbers, there's a national shortage of Adderall. They've got a classroom of kids that have had to quit their meds cold turkey because they can't get them. Could an FDA announcement put the entire pharmaceutical landscape into focus? From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. It was late July when we last heard from the House Select Committee on January 6th. Well, since then, a lot has happened. The FBI found probable cause to believe there were additional documents at Mar-a-Lago which potentially impacted national security. For one, the, the former president of the United States has had his house searched by FBI agents, leading to speculation about a possible indictment. And that doesn't even have anything to do with this. The, the committee will or will not make a criminal referral. We'll that... make a decision as a committee about it. So um, it's possible there will be a criminal referral. Which yes. would be Since that hearing, the committee has heard sworn testimony behind closed doors from even more high-profile names, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the wife of a Supreme Court justice. Virginia Thomas was urging Arizona lawmakers to disregard the votes of Arizonans. There have also been new criminal prosecutions. The committee wanted to have one last hearing about this. Well, it was rescheduled when Hurricane Ian was dominating the headlines, and now the panel is convening in Washington today. ABC's chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl starts us off. John, we're back, right? <laughs> but, like, but why are we back exactly? Do we know what we're about to hear today? It's the series finale. Uh, this is their final hearing, at least the final scheduled hearing uh, of this committee. And it's really uh, more of a summation than, than breaking new ground. This is the January 6th committee, which has uh, conducted dozens of hours of, of hearings over the course of June and July, uh, interviewed, as you know, more than a thousand witnesses. I documented the crowd turn from protesters to rioters to insurrectionists. I was surprised at the size of the group, the anger and the profanity. And really broken, and I think, significant new ground on our understanding, not just of January 6th itself, but on the events that led up to January 6th. And this is where they bring it all back to the main focus, which is Donald Trump. You are going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. So I think what you're going to hear from the committee is a summation of their evidence and some new evidence of how Donald Trump set in motion the events that culminated in the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Are we going to hear witnesses at all, John? Like the, the committee has made hay of, of deposing a lot of people between their last hearing and now. But are, like, are we going to hear from any of those people? My understanding actually is this will be a very unusual congressional hearing and that there will be no live witnesses. Wow. You will hear as the committee has come to do. Uh, segments, uh, clips from the tape depositions that they have done. Sounds like you from the very onset, we're pushing for a strong statement that people should leave the Capitol. Is that right? I was, and others were as well. You will uh, hear some new evidence, uh, particularly uh, on the question of, of January 6th itself and what Trump and what the Trump White House was told, the warnings they had 
uh, about violence on that day. Uh, that they, as you remember, that there was a battle over Secret Service records. The committee got a lot of records from the Secret Service. Ultimately, mm -hmm. even though uh, many text messages, almost all the text messages have been deleted, they did get hundreds of pages uh, of information from the Secret Service on the events uh, up and around January sixth. So you are going to hear that, but no, this is very unusual, Brad. Uh, you're not going to hear live witnesses. So that makes me wonder, then, John, is that. Like, is part of this timing that we're hearing this, like, this kind of extra cliffhanger episode, <laughs> is that political? You know, like, every lawmaker on this committee is on record saying they don't think Donald Trump should be president ever again. Is a big part of the purpose here just to remind Americans of that as they're about to start filling out their ballots, either at home or in the booth? It's impossible to divorce uh, this committee itself, but especially its final hearing from the political environment coming, you know, just just a couple of weeks uh, before the midterm elections. This is a gross prosecutorial misconduct, and it's coming in so many different forms, whether it's in Atlanta, whether it's from Washington, D.C., whether it's January 6th. You can't claim to be a party of law and order and call the people who attacked the police on January 6th patriots. The committee made a point of doing the bulk of its work uh, before the fall campaign. I mean, they, they wanted to do these hearings initially uh, in the spring and they, you know, time time kind of stretched out as they were doing their investigation. Things took longer. They had to fight for, you know, to get access to witnesses. And and, and those hearings uh, took place over June and July, and they felt they needed, you know, one more uh, time at the plate. They needed one more uh, time to sum up their evidence uh, and present and, and to present some of the new material that they got over the course of the summer. Uh, but look, every member of this committee, as you uh, pointed out, every member of this committee uh, thinks that Donald Trump is a clear and present danger to the United States. Obviously, uh, they don't think that, that he should be anywhere near the Oval Office ever again. And the most important dominant member of this committee, the vice chair, Liz Cheney, is a Republican. Our party has uh, abandoned principle and abandoned value and abandoned fundamental fidelity to the Constitution in order to embrace a cult of personality. But she yeah. has now said that she is committed to ensuring uh, that nobody who denies the truth uh, of the 2020 election uh, should be elected. So she is actually out actively campaigning for Democrats. Uh, Democrats who are running against Republicans who uh, repeat the lies uh, that Donald Trump has told about the election. And this ends up being kind of her last hurrah. She will not be in Congress in January of next year when you'd imagine we might start hearing from them again. Uh, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thank you, Brad. Next up on Start Here, he already had to pay 50 million bucks and that ended up being the cheap verdict. We're back in a bit. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Tis time. The real monster fun begins. Get it, your friends. Oh. And the cat friends. Here they come. <laughs> Why was I cursed for such idiot sisters? Just lucky, I guess. <gasps> Sounds creepy. We're home. 31 Nights of Halloween. Watch all October on Freeform. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source.
I've apologized for past things I said that hurt people's feelings. But I wasn't the first person to question Sandy Hook, and I apologized years ago. For years, the professional conspiracy theorist Alex Jones has been facing lawsuits from family members of the children who were murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Consistently and relentlessly, he described parents and survivors as actors and hoaxers. In August, a jury decided Jones should pay close to $50 million to a family for his defamatory statements, which is a lot of money. But people up in Newtown, Connecticut said, you think that's a lot? Wait until he faces several more plaintiffs in Connecticut. Connecticut, that dollar figure could be way higher. Well, yesterday, with families of the victims on the edge of their seats, a jury found that Alex Jones was indeed liable for way more than $50 million. We're talking about hundreds of millions. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky was covering this trial in Connecticut. And Aaron, I mean, this was the second verdict we've seen in the span of a few months. What was the decision here? It was an astonishing verdict by any measure, Brad. Alex Jones and his company, Free Speech Systems, were ordered to pay almost a billion dollars to the Sandy Hook families that he defamed. That's nearly double what the plaintiff's attorneys had hoped for. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please listen to your verdict as it is read. And it did leave some of the families reeling. We saw one, Robbie Parker, who endured particularly vitriolic and relentless attacks from Jones and his followers, bent over weeping in the spectator's gallery as that verdict came down. Total fair, just, and reasonable damages to plaintiff Robert Parker and against Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems and line A and line B, total $120 million. We are so very grateful to this jury. And their attorneys said that it represented a, a real moment in the country when the truth seemed to matter. To reveal lies masquerading as truth and to set right a historic wrong. It, billion with a B, Aaron? Like, how did the jury arrive at that figure? They had two things that they had to figure out. How much each of the plaintiffs, and there were 15 of them, uh, the, how much each was entitled to for the defamation and the slander that, that Alex Jones inflicted, and then the emotional distress that he inflicted. And, and, and that number was often higher. And I'm walking down this random street in Seattle, and this guy uh, walking the other direction kind of gives me one of those looks like, you look familiar. The families so, testified over the three-and-a-half-week trial that they were just tormented by followers of Alex Jones who believed his lies. And this guy just kept following me and he was just in my ear the whole way, just. <sighs> Emily's alive, isn't she? She's alive, huh? Son of a she's alive. That just... the massacre was a hoax, that they were actors following a script written by the government in order to build support for gun control. She told us that somebody had come to the house knocked on the door and she opened the door and this person demanded to see Ben. I know he's here, I know he's alive. And attacking us as actors and telling us that Aviel didn't exist and that we were just trying to, to get money from the public. They talked about how... being harassed at their children's funerals. They talked about being threatened with rape or death. Attempted to report it to the police department in the town that I lived in and I was just told that it wasn't specific enough or they couldn't track it or you know the post had been deleted or taken down or the account was deleted and there was just no way possible to keep up or do anything. And this endured for years and still they say endures now. I'll use an alias if I have to order an Uber or some sort of car service, um, use a different name when I check into hotels even as they hope this verdict will effectively silence Alex Jones. You said his followers believed his lies. Did Alex Jones believe his lies, Aaron? Because that seems to have been part of his rationale over, like, multiple trials now. This idea of, like, if it's about knowingly defaming someone, I didn't knowingly do anything. Like, I believed what I said at the time. He said he believed it initially, that it was at least possible the massacre could have been staged. And but I legitimately thought it might have been staged, and I stand by that, and I don't apologize for it. And, and, and don't apologize, Mr. Jones. Please don't apologize. No, I've already apologized to the parents over because and over again. Because we know you're I don't apologize to you. Objection. Don't apologize to you.
But the whole point plaintiff's lawyers exposed during the trial was to profit off of an audience that was primed to believe his lies. 38% increase in sessions, 36% increase in users, page views of 43%. It was working. And as you know, the reason this matters so much is because this audience meant dollar signs with Alex Jones. Uh, he talked about the government being out to get your guns and all sorts of other conspiracy theories. And he had just the products to help soothe the pain. And that's how he made millions of dollars. And that's why the plaintiff's attorneys are convinced, even if he can't quite pay $965 million, he can sure pay a lot of it. Right. I was going to say, is is this a number that Alex Jones will end up paying? What what has his reaction been so far? Like, does he have a billion dollars in his bank account? As the verdict was being read, Alex Jones was actually on his InfoWars show. Ain't going to be happening. Ain't no money. The verdict was being simulcast, and Jones had an immediate reaction. Fifty-seven million, twenty million, fifty million, eighty million, hundred million, blah blah. You get a million. You get a hundred million. You get a fifty million. He says he does not have the money, but he has also put some of his companies into bankruptcy, and the plaintiff's lawyers pledged after the verdict was read outside court that they would scrap for every single dollar. How many millions did he make off of this this process? How many more millions? How many? How many? How much beet juice is he selling right now? How much bogus iodine supplements? They said, just know that that money is going directly into the pocket of a Sandy Hook Elementary School victim's family. Uh, yeah, poetic justice. We'll see what the dollar amount of the justice ends up being after appeals and after sort of whatever other bankruptcies we're going to see play out here. Uh, Aaron Katursky, huge verdict, as you said. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. So I have not had a great last 48 hours, and I'll tell you why. Hi, my name is Brad Milky. Um, I called earlier today about um, a drug that I'm still... like. It's time for you to know something about me. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. You've probably heard of it. I probably should have looked into it when my fourth grade teacher had to revolutionize her timeout system to deal with me. But here we are now. I'm now on ADHD meds. They've changed my life. It's great. Except this week, I can't get any. Really? Okay. Um, just really... <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really helpful to me. Um, okay. I thought it was this kind of weird shipping hiccup with my local pharmacy until I called more and more pharmacies. No one had anything to give me. And then I started seeing headlines in other states from other ADHD patients, all of whom are struggling to get their hands on drugs like Adderall. This medication made a huge difference in my child's functioning. And now we get to remember what it's like without it, I guess. Yesterday, the FDA announced there is a shortage of Adderall in the country. So let's go to Sony Salzman from ABC's medical unit. Sony, how widespread has this shortage become? Yeah, thanks, Brad. You know, we have heard over the past couple weeks from everywhere from social media to local school boards that people are having trouble filling those Adderall prescriptions. If they've got a classroom of kids that have had to quit their meds cold turkey because they can't get them, we've got some issues going on and brewing here. Children that are not getting what they need are not coming into the classroom prepared to learn, and it creates a stressful environment for for all involved. And now the FDA has come out officially to say, indeed, there is a nationwide shortage of Adderall. And we don't have hard numbers on that, but we do know it means some people are having trouble when they show up to the pharmacy to get those prescriptions filled. And we just heard from Teva, the largest maker of Adderall in the United States. And what they confirmed to us is actually really interesting. They say they're making the same amount of Adderall this year as they did last year, but the demand has surged for the drug. And that's one of the contributing factors here. I was going to say, can you just describe why there is a shortage right now? Yeah, there's a lot of different reasons for the shortage. Now, one of the big reasons is the same reason that affects the entire economy. This pandemic has created labor shortages, there's supply chain issues, all of that affects the pharmaceutical industry just like every other industry, right? Now, that aside, there are additional constraints on Adderall. 
Adderall is what's considered a Schedule II pharmaceutical. That means it has abuse potential. That means there are a ton of extra restrictions on it. There are caps on it. Um, there's a lot of regulations. So, you know, it's not as easy as just turning up a dial and spitting out more Adderall, right? Now, another consideration here is this demand piece. And, and Teva Pharmaceuticals touched on that. They say they're seeing more demand. Um, and we know that in the past, you know, decade or even more, more and more people have been prescribed Adderall, often appropriately. And we don't have very specific data on what's been happening during the pandemic itself, these last two and a half years. But we do know there's been an explosion of telehealth services. And maybe there's some other factors at play that just aren't super transparent right now. Oh, I, like if somebody's sitting at home with their kid who's been on Zoom school all of a sudden, they're like, wait, this is... <laughs> This is worse than I thought. Maybe Adderall or maybe one of these ADHD drugs is the answer. Like, that could be part of the increased demand as well. Yeah, potentially. I mean, it's it's hard to say, but that could potentially be it. We know there's also been an explosion in telehealth services. So, you know, it, during the pandemic, some restrictions were eased. Um, you are able to communicate with a doctor remotely. And we know there are companies that cropped up during the pandemic. Cerebral makes taking care of yourself fun, exciting, and not to mention affordable. That specifically catered to um, attention deficit disorder mm. um, and all of these conditions and, and wanted to make it easier for folks to get those prescriptions from home. Well, and how impactful is this, Sony? Because I, I, I know in my life, like my hands are literally jittering, but from like a less biased perspective, I mean, on the macro level, how big of a deal is it if some Americans are just a little bit more flighty at work or like can't concentrate as well? Like what? Is this a huge deal beyond a few patients here and there? Yeah, that's a really important question, Brad. So we reached out to the American Psychiatric Association, and what they told us I think is really important context for people to hear, which is that this is not a life or death situation, although certainly people who have ADHD can be uncomfortable if they stop taking this medication, right? It's like a feeling of being when you first wake up in the morning and you can't quite think. It's like that all day long for me without it. But really, really crucially, if you are struggling to fill your prescription, what the American Psychiatric Association tells us is that you need to call your doctor. They may be able to work with you to come up with an alternative, you know, treatment strategy in the meantime to kind of bridge the gap. And crucially, the most important thing is never, ever buy a pill from even a friend or a family member because we just don't know where that pill came from. And there are a lot of counterfeit pills on the market. And some of those counterfeit pills have fentanyl and other kind of scary, illicit stuff in them. So never buy Adderall from anyone except your pharmacist that you trust and know, a legitimate pharmacist. So is that one of the ramifications here, Sony? That, that is, pe if people can't get the drugs they're used to, then they reach out elsewhere and all of a sudden they're on the black market and that's where bad stuff starts happening? Well, that's certainly a hypothetical concern, and it's certainly something that doctors are getting out in front of and warning people not to do. If you can't get your prescription, please do not turn to an illegitimate source to, to get your prescription that way. Wow, yeah, absolutely fascinating here. All right, Sony Salzman with ABC's Medical Unit. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Brad. And one last thing. Something is happening in the music world right now. Bands are finally back on the road, but almost the minute they get out, some of them are hanging a U and coming right back home. Part of that, of course, is COVID. Several artists have had to cancel weeks' worth of shows, but even among those who are staying healthy, it's an ailing economy that is canceling tours left and right. What the artist Santa Gold recently canceled her tour dates, as did the indie group Animal Collective. And in their respective statements, they each pointed to shifting economic realities as the reason why. Wait, Jason, I thought this was supposed to be the year that, like, concerts are back, man. Live performances, we're back. Yeah, I mean, they are. And for some, if you're Harry Styles, then yeah. That's ABC's entertainment correspondent Jason Nathanson, who says there are a few major issues that have turned this industry on its head in recent months. For the smaller artist, things have been really tough, and we're kind of getting a, a picture of the, the financial reality for a lot of these bands who are working bands. Especially for bands that aren't household names. One of the reasons is gas prices. There was a small band called Wednesday out of North Carolina. They're an indie band. 
they gave us their uh, iPhone notes of how much it costs to do everything. And they list gas on there and Airbnbs and, and eventually what they made. After playing the South by Southwest tour, they were in the hole $98. To which I initially thought, oh, well, I guess these bands will just have to spend less money on gas and maybe more money on recording albums. You know, the thing they're supposed to do. Jason said, no, you don't get it. The album doesn't make you money. The tour does. So that's why you see some of these older acts tour into their 70s and 80s because that's that's where the money comes from. Uh, you sell merch at the shows. You get a big cut. And... Uh, for the most part, the record label isn't taking a huge cut of those touring profits. So that's one problem, gas prices. The other issue is something straight out of your economics class, currency values. The British pound slumped to an all-time low against the dollar. In it's really hurting these artists who are going on these tours around the world. If you want to go over and you're getting paid in euros or whatever these days in another country and it's just not doing well against the dollar, then you're losing even more money that way when already the margin was very, very small to begin with. Think about it. So, the British pound has never given you less bang for your buck. The euro isn't much better, meaning why spend your American dollars on those European European tour dates. That was the thinking by the group Animal Collective when they ditched their European tour. They cite inflation, currency devaluation, loaded shipping and transportation costs. Think about that. You got to send all this equipment and stuff uh, uh, halfway across the world and then take it with you from stop to stop. They said they just couldn't make a budget for this tour where they didn't see themselves losing money. When Santigal decided to cancel, she also pointed out this more fundamental issue. Tours, she said, have never been fun. They've never been healthy. Sean Mendez recently canceled his dates over mental health concerns. The singer-songwriter writing in a note to fans, it has become more clear that I need to take the time I've never taken personally. In the past, the reason you did it was financial upside. But if that's not even there anymore, and if mid-level bands have to risk their financial well-being in addition to their emotional well-being, is that worth the trade-off now? The fact that it even came to this shows how lopsided the relationship has become with record labels and now streaming companies. So if you do get the chance to see your favorite act in person, remember, that's not just an overpriced t-shirt, that's gas money. I mean, maybe they could save some money by not printing every city on their t-shirts. Like, the font is too small. What are we doing here, you guys? More on all these stories at abcnews.com and the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm off for a few days. I will be back next week. You're in good hands with Michelle Franzen. I'll see you soon. number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Ready for election night, I'm ready for debate night, I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're gonna make you proud. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man.
ABC News, America's number one news source. Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has released the latest consumer price index, what the numbers mean for the fight against inflation. The new twist in the Mar-a-Lago documents investigation, a new report claims former President Trump ordered an employee to move documents before the FBI search. This as the January 6th committee is set to hold its final hearing. We have the latest on both investigations. An American volunteer has been killed fighting alongside Ukrainian forces against Russia. This is the U.S. pledges more aid to Ukraine, why the Biden administration is betting on more victories in the offensive. But we begin with that new inflation data. The Consumer Price Index shows prices rose 8.2 percent year over year, higher than analysts expected. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus joins me live now for more on that. Alexis, I heard you kind of, you know, I, I heard you <laughs> criticizing this report. You were not happy about these numbers. How significant is this, and what does this do for these fears of a potential recession? Yeah, before we went on.